Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Today is 23 August 2019, and welcome to the U.S. Army Heritage and Education Center. On behalf of the Equal Employment Office, welcome to our Women's Equality Day presentation, The Hello Girls, America's First Women Soldiers. A reminder that the book for today is on sale at the Army Heritage Center Foundation Bookstore and is located at the front entrance. We will have a book signing um, in the back hallway at the end of the lecture, and all the proceeds will go to the foundation to help support everything here at the USAHEC. So today, we'd like to welcome Dr. Elizabeth Cobbs, our guest speaker. Dr. Cobbs is a New York Times bestselling novelist, documentary, filmmaker, and historian. She holds the Melbourne G. Glasscock Chair in American History at Texas A&M University. Dr. Cobbs uncovered the hidden story of the Hello Girls when searching for a topic to honor the centennial of the Great War. When she discovered no book had been written about these remarkable heroines, she began a journey that took her from Seattle to St. Louis to Washington and New Hampshire to find lost government records and personal diaries still packed away as family heirlooms. In 2018, she was appointed an honorary member of the U.S. Army Signal Corps. So ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Elizabeth Cobbs. Thank you so much for joining me here today. I am so deeply honored to be here. Um, and I want to say I, I, I left my home in San Diego, um, long story, because uh, <laughs> I commute to Texas, uh, yesterday at 3 AM. And I, I got into my hotel in Baltimore at 3 AM on a different day because uh, of bad weather. But it's worth it. It's absolutely worth it, because I'm not only here for you, but more importantly, for Grace Banker. I'm here for those women who were our first women soldiers, uh, who were not just, I don't want to say just, that's not quite the right word, who were not angels of mercy as nurses were, and nurses, of course, served, have served long and honorably, but women who were there to help America win its war, not just bind up the wounds of a war. And so this, yeah, I'm, I'm very deeply touched to be able to hear, be here to tell their story, and also partly because when I started to research the book, I found out that the one place I could find any snippet of the diary of this woman was at a place called Carlisle Barracks. <laughs> and I'm thinking, are there cots? Is it, <laughs> is it under the cot? You know, anyway, I, so the Army Heritage Center um, is a place that's been on my radar for a while, so I really appreciate being here. So um, as Mary Elizabeth was saying, I wanted to write a book. And this, is, um, this is actually was my seventh book. I have a new book, an eighth book out. I'll tell you in a moment about that. But um, I wanted to write a nonfiction book about the, uh, about the Great War. And the centennial of World War I was coming up. And I thought, well, now is the time, obviously, to write a book about that conflict. And I think for a lot of Americans, for me as a professional historian who's been teaching US foreign relations you know, since I was in my 20s, um, I, I always I think that we have a sort of vague feeling about World War I. It's like, as Americans, it's like, we can count. You know, World War II, that's important. So there must have been a World War I back there, right? And so we have this a sense of it, but not a deep sense of what the war was about. So what I want to do is write a book that would help get everybody on the same page in terms of what this was going on with this war, but also what was the story of the Hello Girls so a couple words about the war, and then we'll jump into these slides. But um, I think if you had to remember three things about World War I, OK, I'm making this easy. The first one is that this is the world's first technological war. It's the war at the end of that long 19th century when all of these things are invented, when humanity takes a radical turn from millennia before. And actually, we have now all this science and technology and you know, machines and trucks and airplanes and telephones. All these things are invented. And they're all applied to destroying other people. Well, this is what happens, right? And so it changes the nature of war and it changes the face of war in a lot of ways. Uh, one of the ways it changes the face of war is that it brings in a lot of other people who previously might not have been in war who are there to help operate all this technology. So technological war. Secondly, it's the war that brings us the 20th century. It's the war where the whole ways in which human government have been set up, again, for millennia, in the form of great empires, starts to fall apart. 
Now that process really started in 1776 <laughs> when you had that first breakaway republic. But it's with World War I that the giant empire, Ottoman Empire, you know, the Russian Empire, the German Empire, um, begin to sort of, you know, they collapse. And also cracks run under the other, the, the British and the French and the Dutch. And those will ultimately come down with World War II. But it all starts in World War I. The second thing to know is that the beginning of the spread of democracy and Republican meaning you know, non-monarchical forms of government, it really starts there. And that's the world we have today. There's something like 50 or 60 countries in the world in the beginning of the 20th century, and there are 200 now. How do we get to a world of nation states? Okay. The, other, the third thing to know about World War I is that people, even democracies that do, did exist, there were republics, and there weren't very many, a handful, People who had not had much voice begin to really raise their voices and say, well, what about our place in this republic, in this people's form of government? And that brings us to the story of women's suffrage, which comes about largely because of World War I. Now, I realize there are going to be some of you where you're already preparing your questions. Wait a minute, let's talk about Alice Paul and Susan B. Anthony, and obviously we can do that, and I love those stories. But Women's suffrage spreads around the world. In fact, the United States is the 20th country, actually 21st. There are 20 countries before us. Like, we invented this idea. But 20 countries before us passed women's suffrage, and it's largely because of World War I. So that's another thing. So what I want to do today is to tell you the story of, they wind together, actually, women's suffrage and the Hello Girls, the role of women in the US Army. And it's very interesting. Now, by the way, a thing to remember about that is that women were soldiers before they were voters. OK, now you're already thinking, well, how could that happen? Well, that's the way it always has happened. Men without property became voters because they fought in the American Revolutionary War. And there were people who said, if you can bear a musket for your country, then you're, you are a defender of your country. Your country belongs to you. You should be able to vote. So the spread of universal suffrage, meaning this, uh, separated from property ownership, begins with the American Revolution and takes really speeds up in the early 19th century. Black men got the vote because they were soldiers before they were voters. And so the idea that you know, if you can defend your country, if you are, you're willing to lay your life on the line, well, then you deserve a vote. And the same was true for women. And that's why the story of women's participation in the Army, also the Marines, and also the Navy in World War I is such an important piece of the women's suffrage story. Now, OK, last prefatory remark. I'm a professor. We have lots of prefaces, but I promise this is the last one, which is that I have not previously to this written about women's history per se. And uh, I wasn't really thinking about that when I started this project, but the uh, subject came to me. And I think we have this tendency to think and to feel that when we write a subject about women's history, that there's a need to sort of point out a few special people and kind of maybe a little exaggerate their role to show that, well, women were there too. You know, they, they were doing stuff. And what's become clear to me as I wrote this is that that's just, that's just not true. Now, half the people in the world were doing stuff at the same time. And they were often doing very, very important things. And so what's incumbent upon us is to see it and to learn it and to draw it out as we have other important stories. That's our job as historians, is to find those stories that have been lost to us, not because they weren't important in their era, but because people weren't looking for them. And they just thought they weren't important and, and made that judgment. So, um, so I want to begin with, as soon as I figure out how this guy works, OK. So uh, let's begin with the story of women's suffrage, just to kind of level set here. Uh, the idea of suffrage for women had been going since 1848. So for 60, 70 years, women had been making a demand that people thought was pretty much. Um, uh, it, as I said, it was a worldwide phenomenon. This shows Emmeline Pankhurst, who was a British suffragist. And, or actually, I should say suffragette. Now you're thinking, wait a minute, what's the difference? Well, the suffragettes, now that sounds more feminine and polite, doesn't it? Well, of course, you're completely wrong. 
<laughs> the suffragettes were the name for those women who were the most outrageous and who did things like really terrorist acts, like blew up um, mailboxes um, and broke windows. And those were the British, and they were much more out there than the American women. And this shows Emmeline Pankhurst in front of a British lion in, in London, and it shows her being arrested by the Bobbies for civil disobedience. Um, and so the, the, Amer the British wing was actually kind of noisier and, and more uh, strident, one might say, than the American. This, however, shows that the American women began to learn sort of the same thing. This was sort of the first women's march on Washington. I actually shouldn't say sort of. It just was. This was the first women's march on Washington in 1913 at the inauguration of a president who was perceived as, and in fact was, uh, against these equal rights for women. Woodrow Wilson um, had uh, said, I absolutely you know, oppose the idea of a federal suffrage amendment. He told a friend that you know, women who would do that just kind of gave him this chilled, scandalized feeling. Because they were doing this like very improper thing of speaking in public to mixed audiences. So, you know, like I am right now. Um, and so they had this big parade in Washington. Uh, they also practiced some sort of some forms of civil disobedience, again, much milder than the British form, meaning that they stood with signs outside the White House. Now that they were arrested for blocking traffic by standing on the sidewalks. So I'm not quite sure how that works in terms of the traffic. But they were, and then they were imprisoned. And some of them were force-fed because they went on hunger strikes. And there's a wonderful book, by the way. If you, ever, you know, if you know any students who need to write a research paper, tell them to go read um, the book. Um, I don't know. It, I think this is her, actually. Doris Stevens, uh, who at the advanced age of 56 um, was uh, one of these uh, suffragist pro protesters and was in prison. And this shows her getting out of an ambulance after being released for, from prison for speaking out on behalf of women's rights in the United States. All right, so that's the background. I want to talk about um, women in the Army. So when World War I breaks out, as I mentioned, it's a technological war. So the, for the first time, you need people who have technical skills. It's not just a matter of brawn. It's not a matter of how tall you are and how fast you can climb a fence and you know, how quickly you can wade through the mud. It's what skills do you bring? Um, and so, as you see, this is a World War I recruiting poster. It talks about the Signal Corps trains men for telegraph, telephone, and radio. Now, radios and big words like, that's the, that's the cool new technology. And it was, but it wasn't very effective. In fact, radio at this time, even though it's advertised as this interesting thing, radio was actually much less effective than the older technology of the telephone for several reasons. First of all, radio was wireless, which meant that anybody positioned elsewhere could pick up those wireless transmissions. And if they could decode them, uh, they could understand what was being said. And even if they couldn't decode it, they could see that if there were a lot of transmissions coming from one spot, well, that sounds like headquarters to me. So you can go you know, bomb that spot. So they were not a secure form of communications. The other problem with radios is that radios were very heavy. So it actually did feel it to drag a radio field set, um, st a transmitting set out to the field, took three mules to pull the radio set. Lastly, the other problem with radios in this era, the era of World War I, is that they did not yet carry voices. So there were no podcasts, right? <laughs> what they, they were essentially Morse code. And so a radio would take one person to, you know, transmit the thing, would take another person to un un decode it, another person to run the message to whoever else needed to get the message. So they were a very clumsy form of technology. Telephones were completely different. Telephone, you could have a wire on a spindle, and you could run it across a field into a crater and to the other side of a trench or wherever. So, radio, so, t uh, so it was a very lightweight form of technology. In fact, they were very popular in the West or in rural areas because you could string the lines along a bush or along a fence. Um, so you could take them anywhere very quickly. Uh, they were also a much more secure form of communication because you actually had to find the precise line, and you had no idea where it was going. And then you would tap into that line, which maybe it's the right line, maybe it's the wrong line. Um, you could hear the conversation, but the person on the other end could also hear a tap. You know, the, It would sound different. I know, I'm sure we've all, we're all old enough here, right? 
I was a kid once. <laughs> I picked up the phone to see what my brother was saying. So, you know, you could, uh, you could hear it. And the other person knew you were tapping him. Um, and then the other thing, of course, is that rodeos were spontaneous person-to-person -person communication. One person spoke, the other person heard. Instant. And you knew exactly what they were saying. Very different form of technology. So the radio is um, you know, put out there as being this sexy new thing, but it was really not there. So as a result of this, all sides used, used um, tele telephones during the war. This shows you, of course, a German in their trenches. And the man on the left, what he's doing, he's got, well, the telephone to his ear. Because every order to advance or retreat or to fire or to hold your fire or to get out the wounded is communicated by telephone. Now, by the way, there are still like carrier pigeons in a really bad situation. The, the lost battalion, the famous battalion of World War I had like a pigeon left by the end or something. And, you know, I mean, there's things like that. You know, if you're all, all else fails. But telephone was the primary way that everybody communicated. This slide shows you a Japanese man. Now, the uh, Japanese were on the side of the Allies in World War I, and he's on the far right because he needs to know. So artillery commands are communicated by telephone. Uh, ra uh, telephone communications went to airfields. Eddie Rickenbacker, the famous World War I ace, spent a lot of time just waiting for the telephone to ring. In fact, when he got up above France at one point, he looked down and he said, it looks like a telephone switchboard down there. That's how important that imagery was. That that's what he compared it to, flashes of light you know, going off as people were bombarding. So the telephone was very, very important. And as I mentioned, it could be run anywhere. These are actually literally Bell telephone linemen uh, who are in the trenches of World War I. This is at the Battle of the Somme. Now, the Somme River, for those of you who know any World War I history, you know that's the great and tragic um, British uh, site of great British casualties in World War I. Now, by the way, I say Bell Telephone Linemen because at this time, the Army was a teeny, tiny, rickety organization at the start of World War I because the United States had a long history of being a neutral nation that really persists up until 1947. Yes, we had ad hoc episodes of intervention in various areas, and we had our own wars, but as a country, our policy was to be neutral. Um, and so what happens is that the Army suddenly has to go from I think they had like 51 men in the Signal Corps at the start of World War I. 51. So one of the things that they did is that the head of the Signal Corps, George Squire, General George Squire, he went to AT&T and the railroads and et cetera. But he said, what we'd like to do is write a law, a reserve officer corps law that will put all of you gentlemen, including the, the CEO of AT&T in Army uniform for the rest of the war, and we will take your units from Carlisle, Pennsylvania, San Francisco, California, from Omaha, Nebraska. We will take them as groups of men who have already all worked together as linemen or whatever. We'll take them to France. They were called the Bell Battalions. So AT&T, which is also the larger name for, uh, for uh, Bell, had a very important role. And of course, they could be fixed easily. As I mentioned, these lines not only could go anywhere, but here are men repairing lines under gas attack. It could be a very dangerous, very, you know, an, a very valiant kind of occupation to just go out there and fix that line. Because if you don't fix that line, your unit is cut off from civilization. You do not know what's happening. So when General John Pearl got to France, uh, one of the first things he discovered is that there was a problem with the telephones. Now, there are a couple problems. First of all, France did not have, uh, they had something like 2% of all the phones uh, in the US had, I can't remember now, 60%. We had the highest, and I'm, I'm trot out my new word for me as well as for you, highest teledensity of the, in the world was in the United States at that time. The most phones, the most connected, partly because we're just such a doggone huge country that we had to find a way to communicate over vast distances. And you could do it so easily and cheaply with that line on a spool, you know, taking it with you. And so we got to France. And the other problem was not only did France not have a lot of telephones, but also the way telephones worked at that time is you would pick up your phone, and it would send. There was no dial on any phone. you pick up the phone, and a little electrical charge would go from your line all the way down to what was called a telephone exchange. A light would go on or a flap would drop. And even today, our word for a dropped call goes back to those flaps dropping down. And that would alert the telephone uh, operator to go, oh, somebody wants to make a call. 
if she, because it almost always was a she, got that call, sometimes it would want to be a toll call. The person would say, I actually want to call Carlisle, Pennsylvania, and I'm in Washington, D.C. So you don't have a line that way. So there would be a relay system as one operator passes the call, patches it through to the next operator until finally they'd call you back and say, your call is ready, sir. You may speak now. We've all seen that movie, right? It's a, it's a black and white movie, right? <laughs> so we've all seen that movie. So, oh, I think I'm advancing things without meaning to. Sorry. That's what happens when you get excited. So General John Pershing not only gets there, so there's the, the problem with the toll call is that in France, you have an army PBX, which means a local internal phone system. But you don't go very far before you are speaking with French people. Right. And so you get to a telephone exchange, and now you want to speak with somebody farther away, and that person has to. And the American door boys generally did not parlez vous. So they're like stuck. So um, General John Pershing says to Newton Baker, who is the shorter man with a bowler hat, of course, John Pershing looks like he's sent from central casting. Sorry, gentlemen officers in the audience, but you know, you got to really, you know, you got to bring up the game here. You know, he was just Mr. Handsome there, perfect, stunning in every way. Very great disciplinarian. And he's with um, Newton Baker, who's the Secretary of War, and he says, not in this conversation, obviously, but Baker, he tells Baker he wants better operators. Now, Baker was an interesting man. He, we, he did not want what Pershing wanted. But he had famously told Pershing at the beginning of the war, I'm a civilian. I'm going to give you only two orders. Go and come back. It's all up to you. So um, Pershing decides uh, he's been in France for six months. It took the US a year and more to ramp up an army, create an army, and get it ready to fight. Uh, and he tells Newton Baker, I want 100 women, I want them in uniform, I want them under command, and I want them over here as fast as you can do it. Now, you have to understand, the Army did not like the idea of women, inc incorporating women in the Army. I know that's a big surprise uh, to most of you. Um, now, interesting and crazy, and I have talked with friends who are officers in both, uh, all branches, the, the Navy and the Marines were different, and of course, Marines were under Navy. Uh, the Navy's uh, Secretary of the Navy, jo Josephus Daniels, uh, his mother, he was, his wife was a suffragist. His mother um, raised him as a single mom. She was a newspaper publisher. She was single because she was widowed when her husband was killed in the American Civil War for seeming insufficiently, um, well, they were in the South, so insufficiently supportive of the Confederate cause, which he did not support. So anyway, uh, Josephus Daniels decided early on, he contacted his legal counsel, he said, can I recruit women? Uh, they, they looked through all the pages of the documents, and they're like, well, we can't find the word male here. Who knew? So I guess you can. So the Navy ends up recruiting, and also the Marines, a total of 11,000 women. But the Army just does not want to do that. The women in the Navy come in as yeoman, class F, whatever. Um, but the Army really resists that. In fact, I did research in many places in the country, but in the records in Washington, D.C., I found one, to me, kind of humorous letter from a, a, a general out in the West. And he's like, well, we have all these cantonments, as they were called, these temporary Army bases training. And we have to hire women to do laundry. And we have some telephone operators, all civilians. And we need to build some facilities. Uh, and the Army says, no, you can't have the money for that. There will be no facilities. I'm thinking, wow, I guess they just didn't want them to stick around long enough to need to use them, right? <laughs> That's a way to get them to leave on time, right? So they just resisted it. But in this case, because he had told Pershing, you can have whatever you want, and Pershing said, we need women operators, the Army decides, uh, well, I guess we're going to have to proceed. Now, they were, of course, more used to seeing women in these kinds of roles, helping out. You can help American Red Cross. You can knit. You can buy war bonds. You can be a nurse. Medical person. At this point, by the way, it's an interesting situation because they were not yet ranked officers. So medical personnel were not considered truly, they were of the Army, but not in the Army. It's just an interesting little historical detail there. So they weren't yet soldiers, per se, doctors or nurses. Uh, and of course, they, but there was this sort of longer tradition in an extremis that maybe women had this martial spirit. And this was a very famous war bond picture, um, poster in the war of Joan of Arc which had particular meaning at that time 
because she was the maid of Lorraine. You might remember that, the maid of Lorraine. And that's where the army was being fought. I mean, the war so much was about Alsace-Lorraine, right? As was World War II. Oh, my God. But that's why in Strasbourg they had the European Parliament there, because that was sort of like ground zero and always had been. So Joan of Arc, maid of Lorraine, was an important symbol in World War I. And as I said, the U.S. Army and then the uh, Navy, pardon me, and the Marines ultimately decided to recruit women. Um, I always love this poster. If you want to fight, join the Marines. Of course, she doesn't get to fight, but she does get the, soul, the sword. And one of the first 10 women Marines, one of them was the mother of Ginger Rogers, which I always thought was her, the one who, you know, Fred Astaire's dance partner, who said she had to do everything Fred did except backwards and in high heels. So um, anyway, so uh, around the time that the Army decides to start recruiting women, by the way, so do the British. And this is a poster from the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps um, of Great Britain. 40,000 women serve in the British Army. Now, by the way, and that's because the Brits have their, and, and by, they do it, they, it's around, it's the same month and slightly later than the U.S. decides to bring women into the Navy. So in terms of modern fighting forces, the United States and Britain really at the same time, the Americans slightly precede the British. But the British have a very different reason from us. I mean, they are absolutely with their backs against the wall. You know, Paris could fall, and they are next. Um, even so, by the way, there was this worry that girls who would do this might not be nice girls. And there was a lot of hesitation amongst the British about recruiting such women. Um, and so there were a lot of provisions to make sure that they were not, you know, they wouldn't get in trouble. Uh, and that also their status would be clear. For example, British women soldiers were not allowed to salute or be saluted, which, of course, is such a basic exchange of courtesy and recognition of rank and everything else. Um, also, they did not have the standard uh, British military in brass insignia, which I don't recall what that is, but theirs were like fleur-de-lis and roses. I mean, it's like it could have been ponies and rainbows. <laughs> uh, the idea was to show, you know, these are girls after all. So, but they did, they were very important to the war effort. Most served in France, six died in a British, um, pardon me, a German bombardment, at which point Queen Mary adopted them as her regiment, which was an attempt to exchange, extend her authority, her personal morality towards these women who otherwise people did look askance at rather than, with, than looking at them with admiration. So now this brings us back to the Army. So the Army is stuck because this is what telephone operating looks like in the United States. This is, uh, most of the work rooms were almost always entirely women, 85% uh, of telephone operators, which means out in some rural areas, guys were doing it. But uh, in the cities, mostly female telephone operators. If you have really good eyesight, you'll know there are a couple of men in the picture at the very back standing up. That's because it was thought that men were very good at supervising women. Um, <laughs> Men were very good at doing the actual work. So they needed to get those people over there. And one of the reasons why, by the way, another reason for the women, is because when the Army tried to train men to do this job, at which men were not, did not customarily do, they found that it took the average doughboy 60 seconds to connect the call. Now, by the way, this is a very high-pressure job. There are lights, things flashing. You've got 50 calls. You're listening to each call to see if it's, the call is over because you don't have other ways, way of knowing if the call is done. You're yanking cords. You're putting cords in. You're taking calls. You're making notes as to what call came and where it went and how long the call went. And, and in fact, they said the women's hands were like hummingbirds darting over these wires. So the average show boy, and, and also you got a parley vu too, so it's tough. Um, it took the average man 60 seconds took the average female operator 10 seconds. Now, in wartime, which I'm blessed never to have been in, I've observed it from afar, but I'm sure many of you could tell me that in wartime, the difference between 10 seconds and 60 seconds is your life and the lives of a lot of other people. It can be a difference of victory or defeat, and it certainly is a matter of life and death. So uh, they decided ultimately to recruit women. Now, this is the poster that was put out by the YWCA, and you're thinking, why well, the YWCA? And that's the Army said, we're going to bring over 100 women at least to start. We've got two and a half million men to get ready and billet, and we cannot be worrying about 100 dames. So they asked the YWCA, would you be willing to billet the women to figure out their arrangements so that, you know, and they also didn't want to put men 
responsible for the personal lives of women, because this is the Victorian era, don't forget. I mean, this is not quite, I mean, it's a little past that, but not much. Um, so they decided to recruit women, and this picture shows you what a lot of the women actually would have seen. Again, uh, what in the background is a little faded because of the lights overhead, but you see men watching, marching off to war. Um, some are on horseback, some are, most are on their feet. And this is what some of the women actually saw. Now, the great majority of women who went to France, um, like the majority of men, in World War I, there were something like 4 million men in uniform, 1.5 saw combat. So therefore, a lot did not. You know, they were back here in the US, or they were in logistics, they were service of supply, doing very important work, but not the men on the, on the line itself. Uh, so the women, similarly, the majority all in France, but were in uh, parts of France where they were working in logistics on the coastline or elsewhere. Although, by the way, Paris could be really dicey, because Paris was under bombardment several times. And in fact, when the first women first arrived, Paris was under bombardment. But uh, some were much closer to, the, to what they called the war zone and actually would look out their window and see men going out to the front and the stretchers coming back. AT&T was given the task of recruiting the women. Again, this uh, close coordination between private corporations and public service was very intimate in World War I. It was a very different war in that respect. Uh, and so AT&T brought women, uh, 7,600 women volunteered for their first 100 jobs within two weeks of the announcements going out. So half of the men in World War I volunteered, and all of the women did. And so they were brought to centers around uh, the country and uh, trained there and weeded out there, because you, you need 100 and 7,600 have applied. You got your pick. <laughs> and they did pick very carefully. They screened for absolute perfect fluency in French. No language learners here. You know, everybody had to be able to immediately translate, understand anything, quickly relate it. Because the other thing they would do is not only connect calls with French you know, personnel, but they would sometimes have to translate between generals and men in the field. And he's saying this, and he's saying that, and back and forth. So they were doing simultaneous translation while they're answering all of these phone calls and getting them through, doing it in code, because somebody might be tapping the line. So they had to re uh, memorize code lists that would change periodically to make sure that you know, you're not just going to say, I'm, I'm calling this guy. Give me General Pershing. That never happened. So this shows the, a group in San Francisco. You see they are accompanied by none other than Joan of Arc, um, who was this important of World War I, and they're getting ready to serve their country. And I think it says uh, Pacific Telephone and Telegraph Company on there. Once they uh, were trained, uh, they were then winnowed further, and the group that was going to actually go to France was brought to AT&T in New York City, where they trained and learned how to drill and salute and such things that were very foreign to women, foreign to most civilians. Uh, on the rooftop of AT&T, which was then, I think, the second tallest building in, in New York. It was March, so there was snow on the ground, and they were on the roof of one of New York's tallest buildings, uh, preparing to go to northern wintertime, or would ultimately be winter, um, and there they learned how to salute. Now, by the way, because there had never been officers, but, you know, you need them. So what would happen is that one 22-year-old would be told, oh, um, you finished college, didn't you? OK, you're the officer. These nine women are your group. Drill them, have them salute. And suddenly the women are like, OK, all right, got to do that. Yes, sir. Um, the woman on the, on the far, not the, quite the far right, the second from the far right, who's sort of looking as heroic leaders do into the distance, uh, is a woman whose name is Grace Banker. Grace Banker was a 25-year-old college graduate, Barnum, Barnard College, back when women were not allowed into Columbia. And that was the sister school. She actually worked for AT&T in um, Washington, D.C. She wrote one week, I'd love to volunteer. <sighs> she, you know, I don't know if she bit her fingernails, but she was waiting to hear back. She didn't hear back, so a week later she wrote back, I'm not sure if you might have lost my letter. The next week she was fingerprinted, inoculated, and told that she would lead the first unit to France. So it was a pretty stunning transformation. And this shows them on the, um, on the rooftop getting ready to roll out. Far left you have Suzanne Prevost nicknamed the Wildcat. <laughs> In the very front with her arms crossed, I love this one. This is Esther Fresnel, Tootsie to her friends. She was 18 years old. Uh, and then you go over the various women um, who went off in that first unit. 
They sailed to France, of course, uh, in a troop transport. There were seven to 9,000 men in these troop transports. Choose tra troop transports, say that fast. Um, and handfuls of women, uh, of course, in this, this particular case. Um, they got to France. Uh, France was under bombardment. And they, they, the night that they arrived, this is the morning after, the night they arrived, France their hotel right there. Uh, in the middle of the night, air raid sirens went off. They had to go down into the, into the basement. Um, you know, when the shelling stopped, they came back up and went to sleep. They came back out and had their picture taken. Uh, the YWCA woman who was in charge of getting them all set said, I knew then they were going to work out. I just knew they were going to work. Nobody cried. Nobody complained. They were out front, ready to get their picture taken. Now, by the way, when I first saw this picture in the U.S. Army War Records in uh, Washington, D.C. and Maryland, it was a small 8 by 10. And then I projected it one day. And I don't know if you can see, again, the lights don't help. But a number of these women, I'll pick on her. She's looking straight up at the sky. She's got her face forward for the picture, but she's looking up at the sky. And about a third of them are actually looking skyward. And I'm sure they're just waiting. When's the next incoming? Um, so they wanted to work immediately. They were fanned out across France immediately, and, and off they were sent. Uh, two of the women who were in that first group were these two young women, Louise and um, Raymond Le Breton, who were sisters from Berkeley, California. Uh, they were liars, liars, liars. They wanted to be in the war so bad that Raymond, who was 16, told the army that she was 18. And uh, her sister, Louise, who was 18, told the army she was 21. Well, when, I think it's G1 or G2, um, the, the intelligence group went to interview, because all these women had to be double and triple and sometimes quadruple vetted for security. Because you have to remember that these are the people who are literally holding national secrets. When, where are the troops going? What's, what's the troop movement? Who's coming back? What have, what have we changed our mind? What are we telling the French? They're hearing, if they want, all of those calls. So they were absolutely clearly vetted. And the Army officers who um, checked out these two women, it was so fun to read their personal records, because the Army writes, they're very mature for their ages. <laughs> I think these young women are going to do very well. And of course, he's thinking they're already older than they actually are, so it's, it's pretty hilarious. Um, the, arm, the mother said, yes, my daughters can go because parents had to sign permission forms regardless of the age of the woman. And married women were discouraged, or one or two kind of slipped through. But um, I, if you were 31 years old, your parents had to sign. And the mother said, absolutely, I will agree if you send my daughters to the same place that they're kept together. And the army's like, oh, yes. And then they got to Paris and were sent 100 miles apart. So, uh, but they did get to occasionally visit each other. This is in the barracks at New Chateau, which is very close to Verdun, which is where the army ultimately ended up having its largest battles. As you notice, by the way, on the upper right is a poster that they brought to inspire them. And of course, it's a poster of Joan of Arc. Initially, the army thought it would keep most of the women back at headquarters or in these other sort of more remote locations where they're going to be helping with logistics. Um, but what ended up happening is they were quickly so valuable that General Pershing and the, man, the Signal Corps officer in charge of helping him, his right-hand person for communications, whose name was Colonel Parker Hitt. Uh, Parker Hitt knew how good these women were. And he said, sir, I think you're going to need them more than just back at headquarters. So when the first army moved up to the Battle of San Miel, two major American battles, American-led battles, one, the Battle of San Miel and the Battle of Musargan. Uh, he, he says, we need to take these women. And this shows them at the Battle of St. Miel. There were six and then later seven women who followed Pershing wherever he went during the thick of American fighting in World War I. You see them with their gas masks and their trench helmets on the back of their chairs. Uh, they wore dog tags in case of death, um, wore uniforms in case of capture, you know, all the things that protect a soldier and give them some coverage under the Geneva rules. Um, uh, they also were trained in pistols. Um, I know this from the diaries. The Army never said we're going to do this, but the women were trained how to use pistols because their position could be overrun. And this is them at the Battle of San Miel. And they proved so effective that the, um, afterwards, uh, General Pershing actually saw them in the street. And Parker had said, well, would you like to say hello? And so he goes, they go, two men walk across the street. And the women salute him, and, uh, et cetera. And he salutes them. And uh, he says, how's it going? How's are it going all right, ladies? And they go, oh, yes, sir. Wonderful, sir. And he says, is there anything else you'd like? And he says, well, they said, we just would like to be as close to the front as possible. 
And so he turned to Parker Hitney. And, and so that's how women ended up at the Battle of Muzargan as well. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, <laughs> meanwhile, uh, President Wilson is having some trouble of his own because this is a war for democracy, it turns out, as you know, the US understands it, as he understands it. Women are saying he's deceiving the world when he appears to be the prophet of democracy. He is de de opposed to those who demand democracy for this country. And these are women, obviously, in front of the US White House. And in fact, it was the day after he announced his 14 points, which are, if you've never read them, go read them, because they define the entire modern world that we've all been born and lived in. Uh, he defines the 14 points for the war. And the next day, he calls in his best colleagues from Congress, and he said, I've changed my mind, and we're going to go for a federal suffrage amendment. It's that day. Now, he doesn't say it's because of the 14 points, but there is this connection. Other countries are beginning to enfranchise women. Canada, Great Britain, by the way, ultimately Bolshevik Russia and Germany enfranchised women before the United States. So it's pretty hard. It's pretty hard to be the leader of the free world you know, when you've got this thing on your back. And so he gives this beautiful speech to the US Senate. Um, this shows him at a different speech, but he, I think the best speech of his career is about women's suffrage. And he says, are we going to be the last to learn the lesson? And I'm paraphrasing this, but this is more or less what he says, because he says, you know, how can we demand, how can we put ourselves as forward as the leaders of the free world if we're not willing to acknowledge, if, we're, if we say that we're willing to take, to ask for and to take, everything our women citizens can give and still say we don't see what this entitles them to, we can't do that anymore. Some of them, he said, have been on the very skirts of the battle. I like it that he says skirts because, of course, the women were all in their skirts. So by the way, so this is very good news, the women's suffrage movement. President Wilson's on our side now. Unfortunately, it is too late. Um, this is, and by the way, uh, I went a little too fast. In October of 1918, he goes to the Senate. The Senate, of course, turns him down flat. You can talk later, if you like, about why the Senate does that. It has more to do with race than it has to do with sex, interestingly. Like so many problems in American life, it gets hung up on American racism at least as much as sexism. So it's kind of an interesting twist in the tale. But anyway, so that's what's going on. And Woodrow Wilson loses the election in the sense of he loses the Congress. Uh, Henry Cabot Lodge comes in, the Congress turns very much away from Woodrow Wilson's wartime goals, and the fate of the world turns in part on women's suffrage. So back in France, uh, what's going on is, and this is one reason why there's kind of an issue about <clears throat> how do you find this history? I had trouble finding this history. Um, in fact, I have a, a, a good friend, a friend for many years, a uh, male historian who's won the Pulitzer Prize. And when I told him I was going to write this book, he's like, can you get a whole book out of that? The story of women, first women soldiers in the army, is there like a whole book there? I'm like, I think so. I'm going to find it. So part of this is that the informality of using women, that they're really, these are men who are thinking on their feet under extraordinary pressure, trying to make, trying to win a war, right? And General Pershing himself was such an interesting character. His, his nickname was Black Jack Pershing. Here, how many know that, his nickname? Black Jack. And uh, Black Jack was an insult. It was meant to be an insult. Because before it was Black Jack, pardon my, my French, so to speak, it was Nigger Jack. Commuted to Black Jack as he rose in rank because he had, he had led the Buffalo soldiers on the American West. He had had African American soldiers under his command. He thought they were great soldiers, properly trained. They did really good work, and he wasn't shy about saying so. And when he got to West Point, which of course was an all white institution, and people looked at him, cadets who didn't like him, thought he was too much of a disciplinarian, and started to insult him. Uh, I think ultimately he carried the phrase, you know, the title Black Jack with grace and pride. Uh, but he was a man, in other words, who understood what's important in wartime is not the color or the gender or the height or whatever, bad breath, the good breath, other person beside you. It's can they do their job? Are they the best person to do their job? So, um, so he was remarkable and interesting in that respect. Um, so this is what, so it's all happening very fast. And you won't, you won't be able to read this, but at the top it says secret orders. To Miss Banker, Grace Banker, Miss Fresnel, Fresnel, Twitsy to us, and Miss Prevost, the wildcat, just personally. 
And he basically says in this, you know, you are now going to be on the road. You're going with General Pershing, secret orders. You will proceed to the front. That was in the trunk of Grace Banker's family, which they had not opened in many, many decades. So it wasn't an official Garmy document, although it certainly was official at the time, handwritten, but it was the secret command that this uh, colonel was giving to the women uh, under him. They ultimately go to the Mus Argonne. I like this picture. It's very different. It's, it obviously doesn't show you um, anybody fighting or answering a phone or such things. But part of what was going on here was that the idea was, is it weird to have women with men working side by side? Will that be uncomfortable? Will that be scandalous? Can we do that? And so these women were in barracks alongside the men's barracks. They were working with the men day and night, literally 24 hours a day. Um, and they messed with them. I mean, they had lunch and breakfast and dinner together. Uh, at one point, there was four people had a birthday. And they said, let's all, you know, let's have a party. So one of the women officers, I mean, one of the women telephone operators organized a party. You see, of course, wine on the table, because that's how France runs. Rolls, uh, there's champagne, and they're, they're having a party. And they're showing that it's possible for men and women to work together. There was a fire in the barracks right towards the end of the war, October of 1918. Uh, a German prisoner of war camp was right next door, as was the field hospital. P men who were evacuated for wounds were brought, of course, right next door. So, I mean, all, all the horrors, everything that happens in war was happening right in this same space. Um, a German uh, was being, prisoner was being used as an orderly. He kicked over an oil stove. Oops, on accident. Uh, the women's barracks went up in flames. They were very lucky because just the day before, they had just coincidentally moved the exchange equipment to a building next door to a, their wooden shacks, basically. And, uh, and this is equipment that is not replaceable anywhere in Europe. The U.S. has the best telecommunications at that point. You'd have to go 3,000 miles to New Jersey to get any replacements. They're very lucky. They pull it out. Meanwhile, while the women are uh, answering the phone, smoke is filling the building. So they're not in the building that's on flames, but they're in the building next door. It's filling with smoke. They're answering the phones. Men are on the top. Their officers, commanders, colonels are on top, putting it out, trying to put out fire with water. And finally, the men say, you've got to get out. So the women drop their lines, and they run out, and the equipment's pulled out into the field. But fortunately, that building somehow is saved. They push the equipment back in after half an hour, and the women are back on the phones. Now, the General George Squire, head of the US Signal Corps, the man sitting in Washington, had written before, wrote after the war, that if the Army war machine had loses communications for an hour, the whole war collapses. I mean. Think of your own experience, our own experiences. I'm sure some of you didn't even want to turn off your phone right now, right? You're like, do I have to turn it all the way off or can I just turn off the ringer? Well, anyway, I mean, the war machine would collapse without communication. So vital. And uh, so fortunately, when the women got back in, they were very proud that communications for the whole army went down for only half an hour. The war ends, of course, in November, the 11th hour of the 11th of the 11th month of 1918. Um, most of the women come back, two do not. Uh, this woman who led the second unit, Inez Crittenden of San Francisco, California, did not come back. Uh, she died of the same causes that killed the majority of American soldiers who died in World War I, which wasn't combat, but was the influenza pandemic of 1918, 1919, that period of time. So she died of influenza on November 11th was buried in France, where her remains still rest, uh, in the American military cemetery in Paris. Another woman who died was Cora Bartlett, who died in June of 1919, because the women generally went, came before and stayed long after the majority of doughboys. Because logistics people have to be there to get folks there and to get them back home, et cetera. So logistics are incredibly important. Grace Banker was awarded the Distinguished Service Medal while she was serving in occupied Germany. She was very happy not just to receive that medal, but very happy to be reunited with her brother, who uh, was also in the military and for a period of time did not know if he had survived. And he had actually been gassed. So he was there to see his sister you know, be the first woman soldier. Uh, I'm separating out nurses here, because nurses were not yet actually a part of the military in a, in a way. It was this odd distinction that was being made about medical personnel at the time. Uh, and she received her Distinguished Service Medal. The war did not turn out as well for Woodrow Wilson, as we all know. Uh, U.S. won the war, but in a way lost the peace. Uh, the framework of world peace was devised to an important extent by Woodrow Wilson. 
the idea of a peace without victory. That's the most fundamental notion that we can take away from the 20th century. So when people say we need to have spoils of war, don't listen to that. That's the preceding 3,000 years of human history. The lesson of, of, of World War I, lesson especially of World War II, is do not, you want to have a peace without a victory. The idea is to win, but not to turn that into an opportunity to punish or rob uh, your opponent. So, but that did not really go forward. U.S. did not sign, and that's partly because of Woodrow Wilson's earlier political deci decisions. Well, when the came, women came back, they were fed by Bell Telephone. Bell Telephone, you know, lots of newspapers carried their stories. They were very proud of America's first women to roll. A number of the women led the, victory, the Armistice Day parades in subsequent years in their small towns across America. We have one hello girl in our town, and she gets to lead the parade. And a lot of pictures of that's super sweet. Um, and therefore, it was also, however, very ironic. You now see one of the women uh, at much advanced age, her late 80s. Uh, what they also found when they got home was something much more mysterious. They found that the Army, unlike the Navy and Marines, which used women in great numbers, Army just had you know, 233 women at Centre France, the Army said, oh, wait, well, you're not veterans. You are contract workers. And the women said, wait a minute. Uh, we didn't sign a contract. We took the Army oath. Uh, yeah, but you were contract workers. Well, we wore dog tags. We were told we're under military uh, court martial. Yeah, well, we can court martial citizens when we feel like it. Um, so there are all these all these reasons. And the women found that they were not entitled to hospitalization. A number of them had permanent disabilities. And when they went to army uh, hospitals after the war, they were turned away um, because they were not they had not been given official discharge papers. They were discharged, but not given a discharge paper. And that was an important distinction, as I'm sure many of you know. So this woman I picture here in her late 80s is one named Merle Egan Anderson. She was actually the woman who ran the telephone communications for the US portion of the Versailles Peace Conference. So she, too, stayed well after the war, came home in June of 1919. And uh, throughout her life, she and a handful of other women, they couldn't get over it. How could the army not? Recognize that we're veterans. How could we not, as one woman said in her late 80s, all I want is a flag on my coffin. You know, I'm not asking for money. By the way, there were a lot of significant financial be benefits for veterans after World War I. The women didn't get those either. But ultimately, what they just wanted to be recognized is that they'd been there. They'd done it. They braved those submarines. They braved those German planes. So Merle Egan Anderson led a 60-year battle to gain recognition through the US Congress. The young man who ultimately came to her aid, not on a white horse, but he might have been. He was 29 and she was 89. And he read about her story in a Seattle newspaper because she liked to make, make a Barbie doll and she'd show a teeny tiny uniform and put her own brass insignia on the hat and take it to children and tell the children about the story of the Hello Girls. They were there and this shouldn't be lost, the story of World War I. He read the story, he came to her, how can I help? So he, along with a number of other people, ultimately, he made contacts with people like Congresswoman Lindy Boggs of Louisiana, by the way, the mother of Cokie Roberts, in case that's of interest to you all, Barry Goldwater, and the National Organization for Women. Now, those are not usually all said in the same sentence, because uh, he was a very conservative Republican. Uh, they came together, and he banded together with these women, partly because he had been a service pilot, uh, air service pilot in World War II, and he found out that the WASPs, of World War II, who flew the same planes he did on the same kinds of missions, were not given the benefits he did. So the bill that went through Congress ultimately acknowledged the women of World War I, the WASP pilots, and the Hello Girls, I mean, of World War II, and the Hello Girls of World War I. Merle Egan Anderson was there with two other survivors. Uh, she was now 91 when she got her victory medal. She gave a speech in Seattle at the Army base there and said, I'm so proud to receive my victory medals, not only for serving in France, but for fighting the US Army for 60 years <laughs> and winning. <laughs> so that's her story. Today, by the way, there is a bill in Congress, a bipartisan bill, to award the uh, Hello Girls a Congressional Gold Medal. And if you feel inspired, uh, please drop your congressperson or your senator a note to that effect. It would be lovely to see them honored, and at least posthumously. And of course, I've written a book. This is just on the right, shows you the hardbound copy, which has that poster. And on the left is a picture of the Hello Girls. Um, I want to say I'm, a, I'm on a little bit of a military kick, which is not something I normally do, although my specialty has always been US foreign relations. 
But I'm now writing it. My last book just came out. Um, it's not available here, but it's on another woman veteran who really needs to be recognized as one of our first military commanders. Uh, you know, I'm, of course, now I'm, I've got that word wrong. I'm sure commander means something more specific than what I'm using. What I mean is that she led a unit, uh, a unit of scouts in the American Civil War. So my latest book, actually, I write historical novels. Nonfiction is Tubman. So if you're interested in Harriet Tubman's military service, you might want to read that in command. So I think that's it. We now have approximately five minutes for questions. If you could please raise your hand, I'll bring the mic around. I was just curious, did Harriet Tubman have to dress as a man to be in the Civil War? No, she did not. Um, she had to dress as a slave. As a slave. Harriet Tubman uh, was a spy and a scout behind the lines, but she had been, in a sense, a scout and a spy for decades, right? She knew how to slip past people who would always underestimate who she was as a woman, as a small, very, she was five foot tall, so shorter than me, um, and, and very good at blending with her, her circumstances. She also, by the way, fought for her military pension and received it after 30 years, uh, being recognized in that way by our government as a person who had a very important role, actually, in helping to devise a, um, a raid in the American South that freed 756 people and destroyed uh, an important bridge uh, that was being used by the Confederates in South Carolina. Other questions? Come on. Yes, sir, right there in the middle. Do you have any sense of why uh, European nations were more amenable to women's service than the United States? OK, so they, they weren't necessarily more amenable to America, a women's service. Actually, women were served. Um, and British women, American women and British women were the most participatory in the war in the sense of military participation, working in war industries, making bombs, and also Russian women. I should include that side of the conflict as well. But in terms of why they were willing to enfranchise women so far in advance of the United States, that was an interesting thing. I didn't, A, know that when I started this book, and B, did not know why. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, race really complicated that story for the United States um, because the biggest holdup were votes of Southern senators against women's suffrage. And they were opposed to any further extension of the suffrage to people of African American descent, right? So to enfranchise, if you enfranchise women, you're enfranchising all women. Uh, and so they did not want to, and they did not want more federal intervention in their own, in their, um, you know, internal state affairs, states' rights and all that. So it is, by the way, so you think I'm like exaggerating that, probably, and I might think it myself. Um, but you go to the congressional record, and the crazy thing is that congressman after congressman, senator after senator gets up and says, hey, look, we all know that the 15th Amendment was a mistake. That's the moment giving black men the vote. There is not one person, at least recorded, who ever stands up and says, oh, no, no, that was a mistake to do. That thing. Instead, they're like, yeah, that was a mistake. Why compound your mistake by passing a women's suffrage amendment? So it's just very interesting to read that piece. Sort of, you know, blithely getting up with nobody objecting. And, and here, that's, so that's 1918 and this, you know, that was passed in 1871, or I can't remember the exact date of the 15th Amendment, but you know, decades before. So that, that issue just kept snagging it in the American context. And of course, European nations don't have that same history. So I think that it, was, it always has been a kind of a complicating factor for Americans that we wrestle with. And every generation wrestles with these things. I want to say, I sometimes feel like after I tell the story, everybody's like, oh, that's so mad. We were so bad back then. And you know, it's just that every generation, the American story, you know, it may begin in 1776, but it's always moving forward. And it's our job, each one of us, to take those ideals and push them a little closer to realization. Because it's, you know, it's what defines us, but it's also what challenges us. Yes, sir, right here in the front, and this lady over there. 
uh, you, you mentioned that there were 100 initially. Uh, how extensive does it become, and what happens to them after the war then? Yeah, that's a good the question. Does continue? Yeah, so what happens after the war is that, first of all, the Navy lawyers go, boy, we've got to close that loophole. Uh, so the Navy goes back and rewrites its legislation so it makes it clear that women can't serve in future wars because uh, that was great, but now it's over, and thank God we're not doing that one again. Um, the Army, uh, as I said, it decides women aren't, weren't real soldiers. Uh, ultimately, there are 223 who served in France. There were still about 100 on the dock at Hoboken ready to ship out. Everybody thought the war was going to go well into 1919. And so once the women proved themselves successful, they just said, okay, we need more. And they were, they were big plans to you know, ship more and more and more women over there to do this important, irreplaceable job. A job whose, exa whose importance you really can't exaggerate. It didn't win the war. But the war would have been a very different war if the United States could not have given commands and received commands and coordinated with their allies who spoke a different language, as it turned out. Um, so after the war, most came home. Most did what women did in that era. They married. They changed their names, which made it a trick to find them after the war as well. A couple generations passed. Their names keep changing. So, um, uh, And they you know, became wives and mothers. Uh, Grace Banker worked for a time for the YWCA and then married and never worked again other than as a volunteer, had four children. Uh, died sadly in 1960, uh, a relatively young age of breast cancer, and so never got to receive you know, those discharge papers which would have meant so much. But now the neat thing is in retrospect, the VA is going back, and if you know anybody who was a hello girl who's a great grandmother or aunt, they can now get a plaque on their grave markers as a service member of World War I. I get goosebumps just saying that. They finally got the flag on their coffins. I think, and then this lady over here. Thank you. Uh, I think you probably just answered my question, but I was wondering if, the, if there was a source of names for all the Hello Girls. Yes, in the, in the Army records, I mean, there's always like any record keeping is a name that falls out or gets added, you know, so some detective work trying to figure out who's who. But yeah, the Army had really good records. And they kept these records partly because after the war, they wanted to rethink, should we have women? Maybe we should include women. Look what these women did. They actually did a really good job. 33 foundations, as well as Grace Banker getting her four and, and, and battle clasps, as they were called, for Mouz Argonne and San Miel and all that stuff. So they wanted to rethink it in the 1920s. So they compiled the whole history of the thing, the list of everybody. And then they decided, Nah. <laughs> so interesting, one of the men, who, an officer to General Pershing, was uh, another famous, later to be famous fellow named George Marshall. And George Marshall worked with the Hello Girls and, uh, and, and SUI, which was the headquarters, the advanced headquarters of the US Army, uh, First Army. And, um, and so when World War II started and they began using women, actually Marshall, in, co in conjunction with Edith Nurse Rogers, who was a US woman, a woman congressman decided that this time they really needed to routinize this whole thing. And so the Women's Army Corps was founded in 1943, I think, is the official date. Um, and so, you know, that's how that kind of went forward. So those records were helpful to me, even though they used them to basically decide that, you know, God, thank God that's over, you know. We don't, we don't want to use women again. But they found that it's really hard to have a war without the personnel who know their stuff. One last question, I think, in the back. Sorry, sir, and I'm happy to take questions afterwards. And if anybody would like to buy the book or have me sign the book, I'd be delighted to do that after. OK, yes. Um, how many of the Hello Girls went on to join the suffragette movement? And did a lot of them do that? Or did most of them just go home and leave, li live their regular lives? Very good question. So were they politically active women? By that point, by the way, by the time that Merle Egan, the one who led this fight until she was so old and crotchety she could hardly stand herself, uh, she, um, she sails into the harbor, I think on June 3rd, and the next day, June 4th, the Congress passes. Finally, the Senate passes the women's suffrage movement. So they did not become. There were a couple of women who were active before the war, before they volunteered, uh, one in particular I'm aware of. Um, but by the time I got back, women's suffrage had, at that point, been passed. And Woodrow Wilson does still remain very active in supporting this cause, even though it's no further real political use to him. Uh, and he pushes for um, ratification, which of course comes on August 26th. 
1920, and that's why we're having this event today in honor of that celebration, the 99th, next year the 100th. So thank you all again for coming and so much for sharing your afternoon. Round of applause, please.